Chapter 1. I will become a dominatrix. I have every reason to believe that Mistress Rose is indeed dead. <laughs> I had never met or heard anything about her until the black envelope arrived at my office desk with a note. Institute of Human Sexuality to Dr. Strong from Mistress Rose. <laughs> Publish my writing, Mike. My name is not Mike, and I don't know any mistresses. I'm Dr. Michael H. Strong, a clinical psychologist and a leading expert on questions of human sexuality. I'm the author of footnotes in this novel. I decided to publish the material, adding my commentary in footnotes, as I believe it would be of interest to psychiatric professionals, sexual freedom activists, and members of the general public interested in psychology. How do you cook dinner when everything seems to be devoid of sense? How and why do you set the table when you know that you are going to die? How? I asked my cat. She watched the photo of Porsche bubbling in the sunlight trench kitchen and didn't move. A six-year-old next door was torturing the piano, as always, day after day after day. The kids were off to school, my husband was off to work, and I folded clean underwear, paid water bill, and rearranged the flowers, lilies, irises. The sun touched my face and played with the sparkly curtains folds. A fly zoomed by the open window, lulling me to sleep. Everything went exactly the same as yesterday and the day before, except for the moment when I sat down to my laptop and Googled sex work. <laughs> A black and red website, fiery letters, yourfantasyworld.com. A leather-clad Asian Amazon squished her heel into the chest of a human ogre, her scarlet lips twisted in a grimace or a smile. Reading the small print, red or black, hurt my eyes. Not sex and vault. The mistresses in this dungeon didn't do sex. Only fantasies. No sex. I closed the window. I withdrew the curtains. I needed this. For what has been five years by then, I had been writing a novel about my dead sister. I wrote and wrote and wrote, but I could never capture the final chapter. It slipped away, it wasn't right. And so, to get it right, I needed to perform the dungeon experiment. I searched the Craigslist job section for dominatrix. Two ads came back. Adult gig, Amazon ladies, let's have fun. And looking for attractive, creative, and open-minded ladies for recreating fantasies. Light switch, friendly team, clean environment. No experience required, we'll train. Mature welcome. No sex. Send short description and a photograph. I reread the ad. Attractive. Well, I did yoga and weight watches, and at parties men asked my husband about that tall Ukrainian chick. <laughs> creative. Ever since I had painted my son's bedroom, green sea, fleecy clouds, white sail, my name introduced me as an artist. Plus, I was a writer. Open-mindedness was my major life principle. Light switch had to research that. And, although I hated to think about myself as mature, I had to acknowledge it. At 38, I was hardly juvenile. Hey, no sex involved. I created myself a new email account, mademoiselle666 at gmail.com. Wow, <laughs> at St. Martin's Beach, photo taken from afar. My red hair gleaming in the Caribbean sun, my blue bikini shining against my tent, and wrote a note, Dear Sir Madam, in response to your ad, my heart was racing and my palms got clammy, but I shook my head, hit the send button, and jumped at the sound of an explosion from the kitchen. <laughs> Mistress Rose succeeded in finding an opening and passing the dungeon interview with Mistress Mommy, a 60-year-old dominatrix who looked like Mother Theresa 
and sounded like Ivan the Terrible. <laughs> Konami then introduced Mistress Rose to the dungeon daily life. One by one, Mistress Rose got used to the parade of clients excited by strange objects, toilet brushes, dog leashes, clothespins and ballet shoes. She followed a script and tortured men, millionaires excited by enemas, surgeons prancing in tutus, foot fetishists, home to dungeon, dungeon to home. What's normal? Nothing is normal. Marquis de Sade was right. All universal principles are idle fantasies. Chapter 6. What's normal? So, how was your first food fetishist, Rose? inquired Mommy after my first food fetishist session. She was at the desk, smoking, fidgeting, and editing the yourfantasyworld.com website. It was easy and strange, I said. You don't say. Was he Asian in his 60s? No. Jewish in his 20s? Oh, my mistake. That other guy did tour and foot worship with his teeth. Boy, did he like to have a spike heel jammed into his nipple. Try balancing on the bed in your heels on one foot. His younger sister studied ballet back in Hong Kong. She was saying she had bit the shit out of him with her toe shoe. That guy first would lick your heels, he'd squeal like a puppy, and then he'd stop and bark like a bulldog. Pinch my breast, pinch my breast. So, what was strange about your guy? That's the thing. He seemed so normal, I guess. I mean, he wasn't weird or anything, and that was strange. You know what I mean? He looked like a friend of mine, as normal as it gets. You never know what your friends are up to, what is normal. Mommy roared with her haunted house laughter. She rotated her chair and faced me. Are you normal? Or me? Who's normal? She raised her knobby finger. No one, honey. No such thing as bloody normal. You know what bugs me? You turn on the bloody TV and hear people being judgmental. What do they know? They know nothing. I heard that fat lady a year ago talking about perverts. She says, monsters. And I think, lady, what do you know? You're a monster too. Just take a good look in the mirror. You're scared shitless because you're a monster, dear. Just like everyone else. True. Growing up socially functional and compliant is always accomplished at the expense of repression of inborn sexual and aggressive drives. Not only boys, but all humans are born with instinctual drives that have to be partially suppressed to socialization, psych which causes mental illness. Modern American psychoanalysis, in its abandoning of the ideas of instinctual drives, shows a perfect example of a group neurosis. You leave my perverts alone! <laughs> Mommy was fidgeting in her chair. My brain sizzled and shriveled under her burning stare like her breakfast bacon. I wanted to go home. I craved feeling my son's flat top under my palm. Felt like hugging him to my chest, drowning in his boyish scent, unwashed yet clean. I'd be good on TV. I tell them a couple of things about perverts, mommy went on, what they're made of and where they're coming from. Where are the perverts coming from, mommy? The same place as you, moms, nannies, teachers, parents. Everyone, given the charge of socializing a child, contributes to that child's neurosis. A human being has two alternatives, growing up as a functional but neurotic individual or being socially ostracized and developing a gross psychiatric disorder. You know that. Your son wants you, but you are here in the dungeon working. So he takes a love in your shoe. Done. A foot fetishist. Fuck you, mommy. You leave my kid alone, I said. He's fine. 
Don't fret, Pat, said Mommy. Your kid's fine. It wasn't about your kid. I'm saying we all screw up our kids one way or another. Get over it. Oh, you go to hell, Mommy, I said. Mommy took a deep drag on her joint. I will, baby, when the time comes. We all will. Nice.